Welcome to the July 26, 2023 Aries Working Group call. A uh, few things, um, topics on the agenda, marketing update, endorser service, and um, RFC pull requests, and notably the one involving uh, community ported updates around unqualified DIDs. Um, we are recording, so we'll be posting a recording afterwards. Reminder, this is a Linux Foundation, Hyperledger Foundation meeting. So the Linux Foundation uh, antitrust policy is in effect, as is the Hyperledger Code of Conduct. Um, anyone new to the meeting that would like to introduce themselves, say hi, or um, talk about what they're doing in the community? Feel free to do so now, or if anyone has any announcements, please grab the mic. Any topics to add to the agenda? All right. Um, I'll start with release status updates. Um, notably, um, release 090 of Akapai has been released with the new um, CredX implementation of an on-cred, so the removal of the URSA uh, dependency and a series of performance improvements and uh, fixes in the CL signatures implementation, so for a non-cred. So that's in place, um, and the release was completed earlier this week. I actually haven't sent out a full announcement yet, but it is on my list for today to um, let everyone in the community know. Um, anyone else have any announcements from the various projects? Uh, Stephen, I was at the AFJ call last week yeah. and had shared the uh, information from this call pre previously about wanting to deprecate um, did uh, the uh, Indy SDK. Yeah. Uh, and so there was a fair amount of discussion about that. And uh, Timo was to get in touch with you to make sure that all the, he understood everything that was going to need to happen and okay. everybody was in sync. Okay. I have not yet heard from him, but hopefully will. I've sent him a few notes this morning about um, other upgrades. So hopefully that'll, that'll come out as well. Thank you for that. Okay. And we did meet with um, the Aries VCX crew, who are I see on the call today as well, and um, they're doing their work on that and um, wanted some other updates and information about using, um, in particular, the Anoncred's Rust implementation. So that too is moving forward in the Aries VCX community. Okay, let's get into our uh, main topics. Um, Helen, I see you are here um, and Alex as well, but can you uh, talk to us about the marketing update and do you want to share? Um, nothing to share today, um, but yeah, happy to give an update. Um, we met yesterday with the Aries Marketing Working Group and had uh, a few folks join us, which is great to have um, further feedback um, on the results of the, the survey that we had presented um, at the last meeting here um, that Alex presented. Uh, and so got, got some really great feedback from others uh, in the community who had um, just some uh, help rounded out that the the survey results, which was great. So um, our next step is that we've identified is to now reach out to the um, Hyperledger Foundation staff um, and talk with them about updating the the website. Um, they're in the process of updating the the entire Hyperledger website, so we're we're trying to figure out how to get in there kind of their workflow to get um, some of that information updated. Um, and then we'll move towards uh, making sure that we are in alignment with the, the layout, um, kind of the prescribed layout that is already there for projects and the wiki as well. So um, a lot of the conversation yesterday was talking about how high level to start uh, some of the messaging and communications and kind of overview, um, and then how to um, 
kind of lower the barrier of entry uh, mm -hmm. for um, use, adoption, contributions, involvement in the community uh, for developers as well. So kind of um, how to describe what the, say, business decision maker needs to see, wants to see, we want them to see, <laughs> and then how to direct um, the developers where to go as well. So I'm really excited for um, the progress uh, in the kind of maturity of, of what we're talking about and what, the direction we're going. And now it's all about um, finding the right uh, um, way to implement it uh, across the kind of various touch points um, that folks um, reach when they are um, heading towards Aries. So uh, stay tuned for, for those updates um, between now and probably our next meeting. Cool. Um, we're having an internal um, workshop at BC Gov, Helen, that um, we hope will be a um, the start of a series of workshops that um, simplify the ramp up for developers and um, that that can be used you know repeatedly within our organization but also will apply outside and so make it um, that that uh, initial climb much much easier than it's been in the past. That sounds awesome. Yeah, I know a lot of organizations are really trying to crack that nut in terms of trying to yeah, just increase adoption, reduce time to adoption, et cetera. Um, we at a DCO just put out a, a short kind of beginner's guide yesterday oh. um, that we're circulating. Yeah, that's more more uh, geared towards the business audience, really explaining what what verifiable credentials do. What I mean, a very, very kind of a very high level. Um, but I think it's it's that sort of essential guide that I think a lot of people, um, especially business decision makers uh, kind of need early on in their their process. So um, yeah, I, I'm happy to post that somewhere if, if folks are interested. Yeah, very. Cool. Um, I would be interested in that as well. Oh, cool. Maybe I'll just put it on the Discord, uh, a link or something. So yeah, everybody can see it. cool, cool. Okay. Um, we're also seeing, by the way, for developers that um, I'm, I'm helping or working with a uh, a person who's um, new to the community and every turn they hit M1 problems on a Mac. Uh, so <laughs> we do have to figure out how to deal with that. Um, we're almost there. We've got lots of fixes, but not quite everywhere. So one thing that um, I would suggest the different projects do is, is make sure that um, somebody is trying these on a, on a plain M1 Mac and seeing how they go and because that's super frustrating when you're just trying to try out the tools and even the demos don't work because of, of issues like that. Okay. Oh, and uh, just one yeah. last thing is that our next uh, Hyperledger Aries marketing committee work meeting <laughs> is yeah. it's last Tuesday of the month. So there'll be one in uh, our next one's in August. And again, even if you're not a marketer, you're not necessarily interested in marketing per se, but you do have opinions about what is useful information for different audiences. Um, please, please, please join us. That's um, the best, uh, some of the best conversation yesterday happened from folks that aren't necessarily in, in the marketing realm, but um, definitely have opinions and ideas about um, kind of Aries communication. And we will be extending a special invitation to Stephen and Sam to join us because we have some questions that we'd like to pick your brain about. So hopefully you guys can join us as well at the end of August. So I'll try to get that on your calendars. <laughs> Um, one other thing to point out to everyone is that um, I believe Hyperledger has said quarter three is identity uh, themed. Yes. Right, Helen? So mm -hmm. basically anyone that wants to, you know, do some promotion or, or have um, Hyperledger promote what they're doing in the community, what they're doing, what their product does and things like that. Um, that's a great opportunity to use Hyperledger to do that. And um and and we encourage that. So uh, definitely keep that in mind. Yeah, and if you have any questions, please feel free to direct your market marketer folks, um, marketing team folks, on your teams to me, and I'm happy to answer any questions or to Ben, um, you know, the Hyperledger staff. They've been putting out, uh, uh, yeah, lots of messages about it. So um, if you have questions or need need further information, please, um, yeah, don't hesitate to reach out. Awesome. Thanks, Hal. No problem. Okay, um, Aries endorser service. Um, we're doing some work in BC Gov, so I, um, we thought we would um, 
share this presentation and sort of set the scene and then talk about what we're doing. So um, Aries Endorser Service, for those not aware, um, Aries Endorser Service um, is a um, Aries repo that contains a pre-configured version of Akapai to act as an endorser. So the idea there is that in your own um, enterprise in your own environment, you can spin up an Aries endorser service um, and then point your Aries agents to use that when necessary. Um, so this, this uh, presentation is about going beyond rejecting or accepting everything, which is where we're at today with the Aries endorser service. So um, a reminder of what the Aries endorser service is, um, originally implemented to support the Hyperledger Indy endorser model. So on Indy, an endorser is allowed, an endorser is a role um, uh, that is given to a DID, and a, an endorser is allowed to write transactions and allow to endorse transactions for others. So basically, um, the endorser uses their DID and verification key from their DID on the Indy network um, when writing transactions to the network for themselves, but they are also use that to endorse transactions for others. And so a, the common pattern is for an organization to have a single endorser and for any other um, services within the enterprise um, to not be an endorser, but rather be an author. Um, an author is not allowed to write transactions unless they are endorsed, means signed by an endorser. So basically all of the other issuers within an, an entity would send a note to an endorser saying, hey, here's this transaction I want to write. Can you endorse it for me? The endorser signs it and either um, writes it, the endorser you know, submits the transaction for writing or sends it back to the author and the author submits it for writing. Either works as long as the signatures are in place. The author must have constructed the transaction. The endorser must have signed it. And then after that, whoever submits it um, is is uh, is able to do so. Um, and then on uh, a public indie ledgers, endorsers are responsible for for paying a tra uh, paying for a transaction that they write and that they endorse. So um, the ledger itself doesn't care what transactions they write as long as they're properly signed by the author and if necessary, an endorser. Um, and then that the endorser um, would then be charged for them. So um, I would note that this model of having a central um, endorsing uh, service within an enterprise may be useful on other verifiable data registries. So as we start to think about using other services, the enterprise might want to have control over who's allowed to write. So an example is in BC Gov. We have a central digital trust, and I think I've got that in here. Maybe I don't. Um, I, I think I've got it later, but basically I'll, I'll, co I'll cover it briefly. In BC Gov, we have a digital trust group, and um, that digital trust group is um, charged with making sure that um, other groups follow the um, policies and regulations um, for using for issuing credentials and for using common schemas and, and doing things in a, a collaborative way. So digital trust group is basically the endorser. And so even, you know, even if we weren't using Indy, we would still want that control to make sure that um, organizations within BC Gov are not um, issuing credentials, for example, that they're not authorized to issue. They're not the actual authority over. Um, we don't want um, rogue organizations, if you will, um, issuing credentials that they shouldn't be issuing on behalf of the BC Gov. Okay. Um, so basically, um, within Akapai at least, and, and certainly with the endorser service, um, there's two roles, the author role and the endorser role. Um, the author simply has to know who is my endorser. Um, currently, they can only have one reflecting that an author only writes to a single ledger. 
So we in BC Gov, for example, we write to multiple ledgers. There is an endorser for each of those ledgers. An author needs to know, hey, which ledger do I write to, and therefore which endorser do I use? Basically, the author the author is handed a uh, did for the endorser, and they can establish a connection with that endorser, and then um, and then send transactions to be endorsed. Um, the endorser needs to know its endorser did. Um, whether it should auto accept a connection request. Should I just accept a connection from anyone that sends them? Should I auto endorse request every time an endorser sends or uh, an author sends a request, should I endorse it? And um, the endorser service doesn't have a controller uh, right now. So it isn't built in. You have to build your own it, with the ARIES uh, endorser service. So as a result of it, if there is no controller that you've implemented, no business rules that you've implemented, it's an auto reject service. And that's the why I had that in the title. Right now, the ARIES endorser service that exists either auto endorses everything because you've told it to or rejects everything because there's no controller to override um, rejecting the requests. Um, there is a configuration on writing, um, you know, the, in, um, sorry, that the first sentence in this is wrong. This would say the author must write the transaction to create, oh, sorry, no, this is right. Um, when using this um, for rights to actual, to indie, the endorser must write the transaction to create the author's did. So the author really has no role in writing the transaction that creates the author's did. The um, author sends the did over, not the transactions, but rather the did in the ver key. And then the endorser writes the transaction and submits it to the ledger. Um, for all other transactions that the author wants to create, to create a schema, cred def, revocation registries, and so on, the author must create the transaction, send it over to the endorser, the endorser may execute the signed transaction or the endorser may pass it back to the author to submit. So either of those work. It doesn't really matter to Indy who, who submits it as long as the correct signatures are on uh, the transaction. The author has to be the author the, uh, and the endorser has to endorse it. So that's basically the roles and, and functionality of the, of, of the endorser service. Um, so preliminary ideas we had for, um, for what the, what a, a finer grained, um, uh, controller might have a finer, um, implementation. So authors might be authenticated somehow and authors would have all or nothing privileges. In other words, if an author was allowed to use an endorser, then that autocorrect would work. The author could write whatever it wanted. So a way we can enforce um, control over the in the endorser would be to create some uh, sort of allow list, a list of dids um, allowed to be endorsed. It's a bit tricky because the author did is not known until the first time they request their did be created. So. Um, so they would submit a request and then it would be held until it would either be rejected off, right off or held until their did was allowed, put into an allow list. And so then we thought, well, we need a UI for managing the allow list. We need we need a way for people to add and, and remove dids from it. Um, but that's hard to do. You know, if you're having a generic service. How do you create a, a UI that will fit everyone's use? That's that's pretty tricky. Um, oops. Um, this touches back on the BC Gov requirements, but a little bit more. We have that. Uh, I mentioned the the Digital Identity and Trust Group approve rights to the ledger. Uh, we we wanted uh, BC Gov wanted finer grain controls. They actually wanted permission not over just whether a uh, an author is allowed to write transactions, but rather every specific transaction um, be approved. So in other words, 
if an author wants to write a particular schema, we would want the digital identity and trust group to look over that schema, review the schema, agree it is necessary, agree that it's appropriate that this group use this schema and not use one that already exists. Um, if if the schema should be one that already exists, the you know the the request to write a schema would be rejected. Um, similarly, you know a, a credential definition and so on. So basically, we wanted control not just over who the authors were, but actually each transaction that the author wants to write. Now that that creates a, a, a logistics problem. How do we implement such a thing? without that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Emiliano uh, Sune, who is um, working on ideas for um, for implementing such a thing. So I'll stop sharing and pass it to you, Emiliano. Thanks, Ivan. Um, I'll put a link in the chat in the meantime, because it's what I'm going to be sharing for the most part. Uh, if I figure out how to share the screen, that would be great. Uh, there's a button called share yeah. screen. It, you know, it's early You're for welcome. me. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. I think you can see my screen, right? Yeah. So this is the an issue that I've logged and we've been um, having a conversation on in the Ears Endorser Service repository in GitHub. And the issue describes a little less in detail um, what Stephen just uh, exposed. So sort of like the requirements we're looking at implementing and provides a, a suggestion or initial starting point at how to uh, implement these access control, these uh, endorsement, more granular controls and configurations. Um, the idea was to keep it as simple as possible, at least for the first cut. As Stephen mentioned, it's, it's hard to come up with like a UX that works for everybody. And um, especially if, you, if we're looking at at the uh, UI controls. So we try to put together something that should work in most cases and should be extensible in the future uh, without too many issues. Uh, I'll just skim, skip to the bottom. Uh, recommendation just to give an overview and then we can open the conversation if you want. The idea would be to have a few different levels of um, authorization um, that are stored in the endorser service as a permission matrix or allow list. Uh, so we would have at the very, like, as an initial step, an allow list to determine who is in the first place allowed to get a connection to the endorser and even have the opportunity to request any type of endorsement transaction. Um, and that can be um, just like a simple table that includes the did of the requestor. Or in case of multi-tenant instances, um, we're working quite a bit uh, with multi-tenant Stackify, in particular with Traction. We're trying to uh, get that to be our default way to go to provision a new a new agent for a, a government business unit that requires one. So in that case, I think we might just want to match on the public URL for the agent, uh, since it's going to be the same for all of the tenants. And these will allow, will allow the, um, a lot, the, the items in the allow list to establish a connection with the endorser, nothing more. Um, the next step would be to have a permission matrix that binds each did to the operations that they can perform. They can public, uh, publish their own did, um, the public did on the ledger. They can publish schemas, cred devs, and while publishing the did is only a true false flag, schemas and cred devs would have three different states that could be um, applied. These are reported up here that are auto, manual, and deny. This comes from a suggestion from Wade Barnes. Uh, these are basically the what would we envision seeing like the, the three paths that could happen. Uh, if a request comes in, it could be automatically approved for a schema. If uh, more on more on that in a second, but the endorser could work automatically on that request. It could require input from 
uh, an administrator. This is what the, happens nowadays. Uh, we need to basically accept the, the endorsement request via API, or we could add a deny in case, I don't know, uh, the, that, that particular author has been misbehaving and is not allowed to request endorsement anymore. And this permission matrix would be a top level uh, type of permission to explicitly set the what each did is allowed to do and how it, everything is treated. And there would be two additional allow lists that depend on that. Uh, so there would be sort of like a, a foreign key relationship on the dids in these table and these two tables. One to allow, uh, one would be an allow list for schemas and um, would specify a schema name and schema version that can be published. This goes back to what Steven mentioned determine whether uh, the author should be allowed to publish that schema or it would be better for them to reuse a schema that's already published. Some ID documents might follow the, the pattern where uh, a higher uh, entity organization publishes the schema. And then in, in Canada, as an example, it could be a federal government publishing like an ID document schema and the provincial governments having their own credential definition. Um, as you can see, there's a possibility of adding wildcards uh, in case it was determined that a specific schema name um, is, is okay and further versions can be uh, updated automatically. And the same thing, uh, so to speak, would happen for the credential definitions that tie an issue and a schema. I see, Steven, you have your hand up. Yeah, just a quick confirmation. When you say manual on the permission matrix, manual yep. implies go to the allow list to check versus um, a, a allow or whatever it was called, where you don't even need to check the allow list. It's just they can do they can do any create any schema, right? Uh, manual manual would just mean that like the request gets to the endorser and stops, and then something needs to happen for it to go through. Uh, it could be updating the allow list and sort of kicking off the process again, uh, if that specific entry can, can be approved, or it could be a one-off, an admin goes to the API for the endorser and manually approves that transaction and, and moves it forward. That, that would be basically a way to uh, handle exceptions. See, but the problem with that is that implies that the Aries endorser service will have a UI, and I think that's probably a bad idea. Uh, uh, you, you can call the APIs that are exposed right now just you know, using Postman or something else, right? Like that, that's really like a edge case scenario uh, that could happen. It, it's, there, there's no really way to prevent it, in, in, in my opinion. And depending on who's running the endorser service, they may or may not, they may decide to, to do it that way or not. Like that's what would happen right now. Like right now, if the, there's nothing um, in place, so if you send, a, send a, um, an endorsement request to the endorser, the transaction would just either be approved automatically, which is definitely what wouldn't not what we want, or sit there until an administrator goes to the API and calls the APIs for the agent to uh, approve the endorsement request. Okay, so what I'm suggesting is that, that that hang option not be an option, that basically the... Not be possible at all, basically. Like not if, be possible if, at all. They'll either get accepted or rejected, and okay. and and therefore um, either, you know, it's either, if it's manual and it's on the allow list, it would be accepted, but if it's manual and not on the allow list, it would get rejected, and, and it would be the responsibility of the caller to decide if they are, um, what to do about retrying. Gotcha. So Stephen, that, that really is some challenges in manual workflows um, because then you end up having to pull the, um, uh, pull the endorser service to, for exception, right? Yes. Yes, but the benefit of that is the endorser service is um, it has no interface, no user interface, and no need, need to um, hang on to things. Otherwise, you're, you're basically just hung there. 
um, if you reject it, at least you can have some. So my thought is presumably the organization the, the knows um, how endorsement happens, uh, you know, how approval happens such that they get on the allow list so they could decide what their retry strategy would be. So there's this, so this endorser service then uh, won't have any APIs to uh, do manual processing then. It does. Yeah, it, it so, does that, that's why the, the the manual step was set there. Wait, can, can, can you can yeah, I, I just want to I just want to throw in my two bits. I, I the manual the manual approval is already an existing workflow within the endorser service. I think it should be left there and it should be left as an option simply because somebody somebody might decide to you know build out a UI around the endorser service and I don't think we want to stop them from being able to do that manual process in my opinion would be if you had a ui basically what would happen let's say somebody uh requested a um endorsement of a particular schema um if you built in you know if you built a a, a ui and notification system around that if you decided to you would end up having notification that a request has come in that would be queued for a, a for review that you could go in, review the request, review the schema, and then, you know, uh, approve that through a UI. I don't think we want to, you know, preclude people from being able to, you know, do enhancements like that. Yeah. This is um, Tim. Um, and yeah, in Ontario, that would break our, our complete um, automation if we didn't have that, that ability. So we use pipelines to approve um, and the endorsers don't know anything about the DIDs really that much. I mean, well, they do, but they get requests by a ticket and then they go in and they um, use pipelines to approve you know, against the APIs. And um, there's a chicken and egg problem, I think, the other way around uh, in terms of process. I'm not so sure you can always pre-configure the, the allow lists before the requests are made. I'm not so sure that's the right, necessarily the right process. It might be, but I think this, the reverse of having requests come in and then be approved makes a lot of sense in certain flows, especially if you're using a um, ticketing system or a, a, an enterprise request, some sort of service um, um, to request approvals for things external to this. Anyway, that's the way we're doing it. So yeah, I just, yeah, yeah I wait. I, breaking that, that, that pattern would break our entire um, deployment. Um. So uh, total uh, now a total agreement, but now I think it just means that there should be a fourth one, which is allow list, um, so that you get uh, uh, so that it it can be that you get approval or rejection based on whether it's in the allow list or not. But I think that's where auto comes in. Auto would just default to the allow list and then you know. Uh, process the rules there and then do what yeah. the allow list says. So that's what auto is to me. Oh, yeah, okay. That, that's right. So auto meant uh, they yeah. did whatever they want. So they would be endorsed. If it came from a certain did, then it would be endorsed. And I think that is also another policy should, that should be there. So that's why I would say there should be a fourth one. Well, that 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 would be, you would have auto at the did permission matrix, and then you would have the did listed in the allow list for schemas yeah. with uh, with name and version as uh, wildcards and in the credential definition allow okay. list at, uh, with wildcards all across. Maybe I should that try. That basically mean uh, auto endorse anything. Uh, I maybe you should try running out. through a, through an example here of uh, how we're how the things were were thought through or or not through thought to, that's to some extent to just try to try and clarify. Uh, one note is noted up here. I kind of like skipped. Uh, over it because I kind of assumed that that was uh, known. Keep in mind that there's um, flags that can be set at the agent level to fully automate um, certain types of actions. As an example, connections, you, you might um, uh, set the endorser to always accept connections from everybody, but not process any request until further rules or input are, are, are in place. Um, anyway, if we do just just run through an example, that might help clarifying what what I meant. Uh, say like some uh, a tenant from a multi-tenant service with the did UI whatever is asking to connect 
for the endorser. If this is the base URL, the connection would um, happen automatically, but until something else is set in the permission matrix and allow list, it, no operations would be automatically endorsed. Somebody would go in the, um, and configure the permission matrix to include the, um, the did and set these uh, flags uh, the way that they wanted. So did uh, pub public true means like these did will be able to request the endorser to publish the did to the ledger and the endorser will accept the transaction and will do it. That's sort of like the only way to do it as uh, based on what the, the presentation that Steven gave uh, before um, explains. And then based on these flags as Wade was um, what was explaining, say like the schema endorsement. If this was set to deny, the transaction request would be rejected, clear, clear and, and, and loud. If it is set to manual, the, trans the transaction is not rejected or accepted. It sits there and goes in, in a queue for an administrator or some kind of process. An administrator could be a theor theoretically like an uh, autom automated process to review it and act on it. If it is set to auto, then it would drill down and look into the uh, allow list for the specific item, uh, let's say it is the schema, and check if there is a did registered for um, that matches the one that is making the request. If the schema that is being requested endorsement for is in the allow list, and if the version for that schema is in the allow list. Keep in mind there could be wildcards. So in theory, if I really wanted to have something super open, don't know the reason, but I could put the wildcards in both columns. In that case, if the, the allow list has an auto flag and there is a match in the allow in, in the allow list, then the, the operation is completed. Otherwise, it would fall back onto the previous uh, state, sort of like hierarchically, which is manual. And it would just like sit there and wait for somebody to um, to act on it. We could change the default behavior to be uh, to deny it. That's something we we can discuss based on, or, or we could make it configurable. But that's kind of like how the the workflow would go through. Uh, I see Warren has his hand up. Yeah, um, another uh, possible use case for this is something where, um, let's say you're a, uh, a software as a service operator and you're running a multi-tenant Akapai on behalf of um, a whole bunch of other um, issuers and verifiers. Mm -hmm. And uh, you want to be able to um, have them be able to publish their their schemas and their cred dafts and the like uh, without them having to be in a list, but you're controlling access to the endorser through your, you know, your network policies and whatever authentication mechanism. And so yeah. you don't necessarily want to be updating the endorsers um, lists to allow those, those functions. So um, this is creating uh, an overhead for that kind of um, deployment, if I understand this correctly? Uh, I mean, there would be a, a small overhead because the list would have to be maintained. But again, you could use wildcards for most of the, well, most the, the schemas and credential definition. The permission matrix would be set explicitly to sort of like there's a record that the agency or an endorsement um, company accepted to endorse transactions for that specific did. And I believe that could also be automated. I'll just give a quick step forward a tiny bit to explain that. Um, the idea, at least initially, to make things simple and also tied into what as we as BCGov think we might be using is to have these tables um, in the endorser service match one-to-one -one, uh, CSV files that can be maintained by a business user uh, rather than having a developer having to go in and, and change them in the database or having a specific UI. The CSV files can be stored somewhere. In our case, it might be a GitHub repository as an example and maintained via pull requests that provides the benefit of being able to run diffs on the state uh, at different um, 
moments in time and see the diffs when you when a request for update is, is being submitted. And then the endorser would just expose uh, some API endpoints to load those files, so to speak. And the load process would be a, a fairly simple. Whatever you're giving me is the, the snapshot of what I'm going to be using. There's not going to be update or merging of, of um, of records is going to be, I don't know, I'm just pushing the credential definition law list. This is the new one. Everything that is there will be replaced. And because it would be iterative, that should not be a, a big problem in theory. Stephen? Yeah, two things. I think Warren's question answered actually by um, right at the top of your screen, what, what connections are allowed? So connection is allowed from your multi-tenant acopides. You could then say, um the global um auto endorse so only connections from here would be created but you auto endorse everything else i think that covers your case um you still might want the overhead of of adding an addition just in case um you know in a zero trust idea you might want to use a little bit more but but that's a possibility um so i think that would cover it um I I and then back to to my point after your description I still think um the extra overhead of having the allow lists beyond the permission matrix is unnecessary if we add a fourth option of of auto actually meaning auto everything for a given did versus um check the allow list for a given did so I think it would be worth having a fourth, but I'm, you know, not a hill to die on, but just that would be my thought is it's worth that fourth option. Just looking at the chat in the meantime, because I noticed there's a couple of messages. Yeah, I'll mention that while you're doing that, that that is the model we're thinking of doing that um, Emiliano handed out, which is that since it's largely business users that are going to approve these, we'll probably do something like use pull requests as the actual mechanism for approving things in GitHub. And then the pull requests will in turn generate these allow lists. They'll be loaded um, into the endorser service, and that's how they'll be maintained is more that way and then um my assumption would be we'd mostly use um uh you know ha have rejection on the other side but but it's possible the other way that that they just hang there if i just don't know what would happen if they're not in the allow list um do they actually hang uh hang there or do we send back a rejection if they're not in the allow list and and then assume that they'll retry after some time but but our yeah. assumption is something like github is the actual human approval part and this will be this service will all be just an automated process i think this ties into the question in the chat from colton uh, about the, the manual um step like basically his question is like if we have this automatic configuration why do we need manual? And I, I think there's two reasons. One is just to provide flexibility. You may want to go a certain level of configuration and, and then just like keep track of who you're endorsing for and do everything manually or with another process that is not built in into the endorser. The other one could be um, the scenario you just described, Stephen, where somebody from just going back to the multi-tenant agency, multi-tenant agency is allowed to connect connects to the endorser and submits an endorsement request before the permission matrix and the allow list and credential definition allow list are updated. This could happen since the tenant might be generated and you may not know the, the did ahead of time. What would happen here is like, you might have the transactions just sit there uh, in and, and wait for manual approval for, with the API, approve those manually and then update the permission matrix and allow list to match what you just did, you know, in order to like not have them have to retry, that could be an option. Oh, I must have then misinterpreted the question. Sorry, Colton.
but yeah, the overall idea is to, to get something that is like flexible enough to cater to most, if not all, use cases with some degree of configuration. Uh, whether this is right or not, I think this is to be debated and decided. Um, to uh, another question I had, um, Emiliano, was, um, is it, do we think it's necessary that in addition to my schema and version that the endorser service actually check that the attributes in the list are the same as what was approved? So my thought there was um, we we could add to the schema allow us an extra field that says here's a here's a a, a CSV list of the attributes, and then uh, that the, the, the endorser service could actually check that the um, the writer is adhering not only to the name and version but also the actual attributes. Um, again, that might be going too far, but we could always leave it as an open option in the future. Yeah, I. I... I honestly had not thought about that. It could be something that we could potentially add as a new column and have wildcards. Um, yeah. I'm I'm wondering how complicated it might become. Uh, if I'm if I'm not wrong, I've heard some something about schemas becoming a little more uh, descriptive than they are right now, than just a list of attributes. And at that point, if we're just like shooting ourselves in the in the foot by adding too much granularity, but I need to think about it a little bit. That's a good point. And then the other point I was uh, going to mention um, about the um, use of GitHub is one of the other reasons for using GitHub, as well as it being relatively easy for anyone to use for, for this type of approval process, but we could also use it to generate a static human consumable, human friendly website that says, here are all the schemas that exist in our ecosystem. And here are all the uh, um, issuers and the credentials they issue uh, that exist in our ecosystem. So that we not only provide fodder for the allow lists, but we also put out a human thing that says, oh, the person credential is this, you know, it is is has a human description to it and so on. One thing that is missing from this list, uh, and I was forgetting, there's a, a longer thread down here that you guys can go in and, and check out uh, separately, is whether we want to get the granular control down to the revocation registry and revocation registry entry as well. Uh, or do you want to set it explicitly what, what's going to happen? Uh, I personally don't have DDS 100% clear on what should be allowed or not allowed or what should do, but just mentioning that there's that possible, that, um, that level of granularity as well that is being discussed. What about a link to the intended schema for verification? Yeah, this is talking to the what Stephen was talking about, but but adding the attributes and stuff like that. Um, I just wanted to mention to the group uh, one of the things that I was thinking about as as far as the allow lists um, and permission matrix goes is that it should be completely explicit um, as to what's going on rather than leaving things um, implicitly uh, working on on something. So. Uh, you'll see in the comments, uh, I'm, I'm really a proponent of, of having the reg, 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 rev def and entries being included in the allow list uh, in the permissions matrix as far as how those are to be processed as well. Um, simply because if they're not there and you don't explicitly define what they are, then what ends up happening in the endorser service is you end up coding uh, hard coding business logic um, uh, around how to deal with those two objects based on what you're doing with either the schema or the more specifically the credential definition associated to those to those objects. Um, that 
whatever you code is going to be one interpretation of what should actually be happening with those objects where and that's not going to work for all situations if it's actually explicitly defined in the permissions matrix then you can let whoever is implementing this decide how they want to deal with those objects it would have to be reported down all the way to the credential definition list or right because like each credential definition is going to have their own rev reg right but that, reg that, that that you can imply um safely because because of there is that one to one between the reg rev and the reg the reg reg def and the rev reg entries i mean you're going to have you know it's it's a one to many uh for the defs and the entries but um that that you can you know uh imply not imply but um you know figure out um, yeah what what i meant is like that. in a situation like this one where the say that the, say that's the same did with two cred devs uh, this is not the case but whatever so the same did with two cred devs if we only have flags at the top here at the top level in the permission matrix then i wouldn't whether this is uh, desirable or not I don't know, but like we wouldn't be able to say, oh, for this first cred def, don't allow more revocation registry entries to be published, but still allow it for the second one. That's what I was going with. Yeah, okay. I, I, I get where you're going with that. Because then we're going, we're getting to the point where we, we seem to be wanting to like do a very like point to point granular control. And at that point, we would need it at this level. Yeah, but I mean, it, there might be a case where, you know, somebody decides, okay, we're going to, you know, we're not going to let this particular issuer, you know, issue any more um, credentials against, you know, any more revocable credentials against this particular schema. And the only way you can really do that is to, you know, stop them from creating uh, reg rev definitions, you know, additional rev reg mm -hmm. definitions. I see Colton, Colton's comment in the chat. Yeah, the, the, the wildcard could be used at this level, similar to what was envisioned above because at that point you have the, the extra two columns here for the rev reg and rev reg entry yep. and you could just have it populated by default with file wildcards to me uh there's a one to many credential definition to rev reg definition and and one to many rev reg definition to entries so that if you have permission to for writing a cred def, it implies you have permission to write any rev reg, reg is associated. And if you ever wanted to cut off somebody from doing updates to, uh, you know, adding more um, definitions or updating the state, you just remove their um, allow list entry for the cred def, and that would be good enough. Um, just because they're they're all linked together. And so that would give you the control that you're looking for, Wade. But uh, yeah, and that's that's I think that's where we also differ on on you know a, a little bit on an opinion with that. Like I think once something's in the allow list, I don't think it should be removed to indicate that it's no longer allowed. It, that causes operational confusion later on because you end up going, okay, well, you know. This person is, you know, this this credential definition is not in this list yet. It's on the red, you know, on the on the ledger, and there's been stuff issued against it. And then you have to go back in the history of the, you know, of the allow list to figure out, okay, yeah, we did, you know, we were endorsing this at one point in time and it it disappeared at this other time, where if it's explicitly denied from the permissions matrix and left in the allow list it it is very clear from at a glance that you know we no longer endorse this you know this credential definition um and then you, the only thing you need to do is go back in the history and go okay well when did we make that decision yeah uh, i think that's getting pretty subtle <laughs> i don't know if it, it, that actually it yeah, you know, one one thing to say is like if we add the extra controls at this level, either pattern would work because you could leave leave the the record and and, and kind of change the permissions or delete it completely, and the results should be the same. 
But either way, you have to change the record. You, you have to yes. change something. Yes. Yeah. Something needs to change for sure. All right. Well, that was all. I'll stop sharing. Took a lot. Um, definitely. Um, so we're going to start implementing something along this at some point, and so um, we'll finalize what what we plan to implement. Welcome um, input from anyone um, based on these questions. Obviously, we're <laughs> we're still debating it. Um, <laughs> open to have that, and and if any others want to use this. Um, let us know what your thoughts are and, and how you would like to see it done because um, we'll see if we can build that in. And with that, we're right out of time. So there won't be any other topics. And Sam will be back next week. So it'll all be better. Thanks all. Take Thank care. Have a good one. Thanks, Thank everyone. You.